Well, kids, this is going to be a long video. Some of you already know what this is. Some of you don't. So I'll start off by saying we're not going to drone on about specs and facts and factoids and part numbers. and No, we're not going to do that. I'm going to talk about the device as an object and how I ended up acquiring this little beast. This thing weighs a ton. All the king's horses and all the king's men threw out their backs trying to lift it onto a desk. Sometimes, as collectors, we um, and just as hobbyists, we, we acquire equipment only to get rid of it um, at some point. And sometimes that equipment finds its way back to us in weird and interesting ways. What you're looking at is an IBM PS2 server, model 9595. At this point in time, I do not know what the specs are. I do not know what options are installed. I do not know how much RAM it has. I don't know how big the hard drive is. But I used to, years ago. I actually saved this computer from the scrap bin in February, uh, was it February or March? I want to say maybe March of 2001. It was going to be scrapped. And I said, hold on. That's a PS2 9595. Now, at the time, it was completely worthless. It had no value. In fact, we had bins and pawn bins of Model M keyboards that we were selling for $5 a piece. It was a different time. The location was a little computer store in Nashua, New Hampshire called Electronic Planet. Electronic Planet was a was a um, it was a special place for me. It was actually my very first legitimate computer job. I was a kid, high school kid. They hired me in um, probably January, two thousand one. They had an ad in the paper looking for um, looking for a technician, and I was just a kid. I'm like, oh, they'll never hire me. <laughs> so I showed up and I interviewed for the job and uh, I was what was I in, in 10th grade I think I think it was in 10th grade and the guy hired me on the spot I couldn't believe it and I asked him why did you hire me and he says you're the only one who had a clue he had interviewed dozens of people some of them with A plus certifications but I, the high school kid, who was only able to work weekends, got the job because I I could tell the difference between a wind modem and a hardware modem. I could tell the difference between a Creative Lab Sound Blaster 16 and just some random Chinese PCI sound card that they had on the shelf. I answered all the questions that he wanted answered, and I answered them correctly, and I was also cheap. <laughs> I think that was why they really hired me. So... It was a fun job for me because I got to play with all the equipment I could get my hands on. <laughs> Electronic Planet was one of those companies. They were they worked with liquidators. Um, they would buy pallet loads of electronic equipment, test equipment. Um, I should I should actually kind of go back a little bit. Electronic Planet was spun off of another company that actually still exists in one form or another called the Electronic Surplus Services. They were based out of Manchester, New Hampshire, and they are still in business. Um, their entire presence has been shifted to an online presence, and everything that they sell is through eBay. In fact, the gentleman who I believe currently runs their auctions was the guy who hired me in 2001. He's still with the company. That's dedication. 
so I uh, I landed the job, and it was like a kid. I was like a kid in a candy store. It was like it was Electronic Planet was a way for them to take all of the computer equipment that they were getting in their in their auctions that they won for palletized random stuff. We're talking office cleanouts, um, business liquidators. You know, you work for a big insurance company, for example, and overnight you get all new equipment, all new computers, new monitors, keyboards, mice, speakers. Where does all that old stuff go? Well, back in the day, they would palletize it, shrink wrap it and auction it off as a lot of 50 IBM um, what models were they selling back then? IBM desktops, for example. I think it was the P the GL model or compact desk pros pallet load of a hundred <laughs> highest bidder wins. We were though, we were the highest bidder <laughs> and we would, we would take these old systems and we would clean them. We would make any necessary repairs. Um, we would wipe the drives and in some cases we'd even install operating systems. Um, but for the most part, those equipment, those, I'm sorry, those systems were sold as is with no operating system, just a DOS prompt, and that was all we would give them. And most of our customers, um, it was a mix of people looking for their new, their first computer. They didn't want to buy new because computers were expensive back then. A brand new system in 2001 would set you back, you know, 1500 bucks for something decent. We were selling workable systems, um, you know, without an operating system, we would sell a desktop for two, three hundred bucks back when you could do that. Um, you know, they were a couple generations behind, but they would do the job. And if you wanted an operating system, we would sell you a Windows license. It was a better, it was, it was a simpler time back then. Most of these computers were used for dial up internet access and that's all they really wanted. We sold laptops. Occasionally would get a pallet of laptops. That was a special occasion because laptops were even more expensive. But that's how the business thrived. We would we would we would buy loads of junk, fix it up, put it on the shelf, and sell it. And this freed up the parent company, Electronic Planet, um, to do what they do best, and that was selling um, engineering supplies, test equipment, components. Um, you know, power supplies, you know, big stuff, workbenches, things like that. You know, when a manufacturing company, see, Nashua, New Hampshire was located within spitting distance of major corporations like Digital Equipment Corporation, Hewlett Packard, uh, Compaq had a presence. Oh, those are all now, those all ended up merging. Um, but a lot of big manufacturers like Teledyne um, or Teradyne, uh, let's see. All the, uh, Sanders Associates, which became BAE, a lot of big companies, big insurance companies, major, major players were, you know, right in our neighborhood. So we would we would buy a lot of equipment that came from those companies. Um, but the computer business and the um, the engineering supplies, that's what I'm going to call it, and uh, electronic technician type stuff. Those are separate entities. Uh, and that's what. Uh, that's um, that's how they how they ran their business. So for a kid like me, a high school kid, working in a shop like this was it was it was something that will never be replicated again, because computer shops like the one I worked in are all gone. They're gone. They're completely gone. Um, we live in a society where everything that's a couple years old or older gets thrown away. Nothing's fixable anymore, at least not without high level skills. And um, essentially manufacturers have shut out the consumers from servicing their own stuff. And in order to service equipment, now you have to be certified. You need to have access to specialized software. It's become a racket. So the the, the core business that was refurbishment and resell of computer equipment um, has mostly evaporated. Computers are so cheap now, why would I buy a used one? With the exception of a Mac, I would never buy a used PC. Why would I do that? They're cheap. 
for a couple hundred bucks, I can buy a system that's actually somewhat decent. Well, back in the day, that same system would cost a couple thousand bucks. Well, maybe not that much, but uh, $2,000 would buy you a really nice system back then. Uh, maybe a little more than that. Maybe, maybe about 3000 depending on what you're going for. Anyway, one of the perks of my job was, and I would ride my bicycle into work. I would ride my little, what did I have back then? I had a bright green mid-70s Fuji 10-speed bicycle. And I would ride my bicycle to work. Um, it was, it wasn't that far from my house. It was only about a couple of miles. Um, but I would ride my bike to work. And um, sometimes that got a little difficult because, well, one of the perks of my job was that I could, I would have first dibs on anything that came into the shop. Anything that came in, I would have first dibs. And I came in one day and this thing was sitting in the stock room in the back. And I said, hey, Brian, that's the guy I worked for. I said, what are you doing with this 9595? And he said, well, we're scrapping it. It's, we can't sell it. We can't get money for it. Nobody wants it. Did I mention we were selling Model M keyboards for $5 a piece? If I had a time machine, oh. Um, and anyway, so I said, well, how much uh, if I wanted to buy it? He says, you can take it, get it out of here. That's how I got my uh, my first Mac laptop. I got a, uh, it was a, um, a PowerBook Duo with the motorized dock. And I got it for free. <laughs> we didn't sell Macs. See, back in 2001, Macs were still kind of taboo. Um, nobody really wanted them. It's like they were coated with a layer of mercury. Um, nobody wanted them um, because they weren't cool. And the iMacs were still, they were still a fairly new product. And... Um, and anyone who wanted a Mac wanted one of those. <laughs> it was a different time. Anyway. It just so happened that on that particular day, I rode my 10-speed bicycle. <laughs> Lucky me. Um, so there was no way I was going to get this thing home. It weighed too much. And even I wouldn't put this on the back of my bike. It had a rack on it, but that was, this was just way too heavy for that thing. So, um, I waited until the next day I had my mom drop me off and, uh, and she, she picked me up and, uh, I, I carted this thing home from there. It ended up, um, it sat in my bedroom floor for a little while. And then about a year later, I was in my, I was at the end of my 11th grade, um, my sophomore year, and my parents said, we are moving. So I had to start liquidating. I had a lot of stuff in my, I had stacks of computers. I think I've shared photos. Um, if you look through my uh, community page on my channel, I posted some photos. In fact, I think this guy is in one of those pictures. Um, so it ended up, um, I had to do something with it. So I had some friends in high school who were, they were computer nuts, just geeks like myself. And I said, hey guys, um, I've got this machine. You guys might want to play with it. It's pretty cool. You know, you can do something with it. And um, so I brought it into high, I brought it into school. Of course, I was friends with the, with the tech staff over there. And, um, you know, so it was it was nothing unusual for me to drag something like this into school. Um, so I brought it into the computer lab and they set it up in a corner somewhere. And, you know, my friends would would mess with it and do whatever, whatever they wanted to the, to the thing and, you know, whatever. Um, so then I ended up transferring to another high school and that was for my senior year. Started my senior year in a new high school. That was that sucked. But, you know. Life is what it is. Things happen. You make the best of it. And I ended up going back to my old high school for, um, they were trying to start this computer club thing. So 
I ended up, um, I befriended this girl, as high schools often, high schoolers often do. <laughs> I became friends with this this girl. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sidebar for a sec. When I started my senior year in my new high school, um, I signed up for a. I was I was late to the game, so all the good classes were all taken, and I signed up for a class. It was it was an introductory to systems administration or something like that. It was something nebulous. I'm like, this could be fun. It was computer related. And I wanted to go into the computer field at some point, um, even though I had just signed up to join the Air Force, which was another topic for another day. So I, um, I ended up, you know, signing up for this class. I show up on day one and there was nobody there. I said, am I in the wrong class? Like, this is what I signed up for. And the teacher says, oh, no, just you and one other kid signed up for this course. So I said, um, okay, <laughs> great. Um, so <laughs> I guess uh, you guys won't be uh, like weighing grades. Like if I, <laughs> what's the scale of the grades if, uh, if one kid fails, yeah, like it doesn't work that way. So Anyway, this this little shrimpy girl shows up. Shrimpy. She was she was actually adorable. Um, but anyway, um, she shows up, and she is every geek kid's dream. I mean, she was just she was so smart and so funny, and she was she was really cool. Um, so naturally I did try to date her, but she, she wasn't really <laughs> into dating, I guess. Um, but because she, she actually, she was single the entire time. Um, but I knew her, but anyway, so she joins the class a little bit later after I did and, and, you know, we got to talking and then she, we got along really well. So I asked her, I said, Hey, um, some of my old friends at my, at my old high school, uh, were, going to start up a little club and you want to come check it out and she says oh sure so we um we took my car to the high school after after we finished out the day we drove over to my um to my old high school and i introduced her to some of my friends and and uh that thing was still sitting there <laughs> it was still sitting up up on one of the cabinets in the computer lab one of the things that I loved about my old high school, and I, I don't know if it's still like this today, but it was one of those schools where it was in a very nice town and you could leave a brand new laptop open back when laptops were thousands of dollars. You could leave it on a table in the computer lab and no one would touch it. I mean, I would leave my stuff in the computer lab, which wasn't under any supervision. Um, it was kind of like on your on the honor system, you know. I'd leave stuff right there on the desk and no one would mess with it. So naturally, you know, this thing, you know, it, it didn't get messed with. No one, nobody touched it. Except for my friends, they would occasionally power it up and mess with it a little bit. Well, anyway, that was it. That was the last time I saw this computer. 2000, it would have been September, October, probably, I would say December of 2002 was the last time I saw this machine. And here it is. How did that happen? Well, things didn't work out with the super nerdy computer girl. She ended up, she graduated as a valedictorian, um, and then she ended up on Broadway. She was, a, she was an actress. Um, I don't know where her career has taken her, but I, I hope she's doing well. Um, I know she got married and, um, but yeah, she, she became, she was an actress. Uh, that's what she wanted to do. And she ended up in plays and I do know she performed on Broadway at one point. Um, so hope she's doing okay. Um, but anyway, <laughs> we haven't seen each other since graduation, but nevertheless, um, let's talk about the computer which is probably why you're all here. So, I pretty much forgot this thing existed. I just assumed 
Oh, yeah, it must have been scrapped. I bet they threw it away. Whatever, no big. And uh, fast forward to today. 2021, July, what is it, July 11th? So. And uh, I get a, um, I get a message on Facebook. One of my old techie friends who uh, still lives in the area, he, um, he, I, I was trying to get rid of some plywood and he responded to my, to my uh, plea for, <laughs> plea for help. I need this plywood gone. I want my garage back. Well, anyway, he um, sent me a message and he said, well, I'll take your plywood, but I've got something that you might be interested in. And I said, oh, really? Well, come on down. So we did. And he pulls out of his car this monstrosity of a PC. And he said, you can have it back. And I said, um, I, my jaw dropped. Once I picked it up off the driveway, because I immediately knew what this was, as soon as he pulled it out of his car. And I said, well, holy crap. <laughs> You've kept it all these years. Yup. Unfreaking believable. 20 years ago. Thunderclap. 20 years ago, I saved this computer from the scrap bin. 20 years later, I'm saving it again. The only difference is now, it's actually worth something. How much, I don't know, but because of the rarity of these machines and so many of them were scrapped because they're not a they're not a desktop pc which is what most collectors seem to be after these days but there are always going to be collectors for rarities and oddities and that is the story of one computer that just showed up today to my house let's take a look inside. Now, I asked my friend if he said it still worked. He didn't, well, the last time he powered it up, he didn't say when it was. It was a long time ago, probably a decade or more. And <clears throat> this thing has got some pretty cool stuff. Um, if I can remember how to take it apart. Oh, wow, it's got one of those. So let's take a look around back. What do we got for, for bits and baubles here? We've got, looks like a, um, what is that? That is for, uh, I believe, a terminal? No, no, that's, um, I know what that is. I can't, and I can't think of the name of it, um, what this connector is for. It's for an adapter. It can be used for um, any type of network connection. This may be, I think this is standard Ethernet. Ah, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. We'll take a look at what the card is. It's got SCSI. Remember, this is a 90s server made uh, copyright 1994, so made in 95, I believe. It's got 25 pin serial. No, two parallel ports, two serial ports, mouse keyboard. But that's not all. <laughs> all right, so to get the cover off, if I'm not mistaken, the front bezel has to be pulled. And I think there's a clip inside here. I think one of those clips is busted off, as is tradition. Uh, let's see. Yeah, one of the clips is indeed broken off, but it could actually be inside there. Now, I believe there's a latch here. You have to undo. It could be more than one. Let's see. Yeah, this uh, I believe swings open. Is 
like that. And then we get to see one of the first really cool features of the Model 9595. And that is going to, oh, there it is. This is the Model 9595's infamous squirrel cage cooling fan. Look at that. Is that cool or what? Nice. Nice to see that's still there. And it spins quite nicely. Alright, let's put that aside. And that just connects um, electrically to these contacts over here. Now I have not had this thing apart since 2001. Unbelievable. Smell that? That's just the smell of all the decaying silicone. 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 Um, so yeah, this is a micro channel, of course. Um, we're not going to be going to Best Buy to get a sound card for this guy anytime soon. Um, this is the what makes these machines pretty unique. This is the CPU daughter board. Um, and as far as I remember, it was a 486. Now these were all shipped as 486s, all the 95s. And uh, this is no exception. There were upgradable, um, well, that's interesting. Interesting that, uh, what that does. Um, some of these were upgraded to Pentium class machines. Um, but for the most part, this was the end of the line for the PS2 name entirely. Uh, I just saw a production date on this guy. It was um, 1994. It was barely legible. And it was on the inside of... Where did I see it? I think it was right here. April 5th, 1994. Okay. So this one's fitted with a SCSI CD-ROM. And you can tell it's a factory drive because it has a blue eject button. So this, this thing is pretty much as it left the factory. Um, it does have an IBM SCSI drive in there. And... Uh, Let's see if I can read it. I think it was a, I think it was a gigabyte, which at the time was enormous. Now getting drives out of this thing, I believe this whole front face has to come off. Like I said, it's been a long time since I've messed with this machine. Twelve three of ninety three on that cable. And there's our CPU card FRU. You can actually look that up. And it'll tell you what it is. 3, 2, G, I can't even, it's barely legible. So I think it's a 3, or is that a 5? Hard to say. Now there's another really interesting feature. Um, look at this massive power supply. This thing is 400 watts. <laughs> 400 watts. Now... I believe that that's continuous. Like this thing, this isn't, it just doesn't peak at 400 and say, ew, stop it. No, this thing, this thing can put some power out. Um, it's also part of the system's cooling system. So you've got an intake, which I think that squirrel cage is an intake, and this is your exhaust. This thing was designed for a lifetime of, of function. Um, these were used in the backbone of American industry for for you could get 20 years out of one of these guys yeah at least without any real problems they were built to run and that's what that's all they were built to do um, power supply comes out fairly easily now I believe I don't think I have to unplug these I've had this apart once and I believe all you do to get to the memory slots you unscrew this guy, and you pull it out like that, and there's your memory. Look at that! Look at that connector, set up at an angle. Now that is American ingenuity. Oh, there's how you get to the hard drive bay. But if you look, you can only slide the rail forward. Okay, so that's not it. There's still room for expansion. 
But there's your CPU card right there. Um, again, these can be upgraded. Let's take that out. Actually, let's not. I'm gonna just uh, drop my camera down inside. We'll see what's on there. What is that? 82496-66. So the CPU's over there. That, I don't know what that is. Interesting. Um, but it is a socketed chip. But this one is probably your processor. This one, I was going to say a co-processor, but I don't think so. Uh, what do we got here? That kind of looks like a G3 chip, but it's not. Um, what I'm looking for is a clock battery. Now, the PS2 line was known for their clock battery issues. And I think it's mounted, if there was one, multimedia link. We'll get to this in a minute. That is that is really cool, um, what it does. But I'm not seeing a battery. I think I might have removed it, actually, many, many years ago. Where was the battery on these? So we've got this, it looks like a chassis intrusion switch here. Right there. Here, let's pop it out. Yeah, it's been leaking too. Let's take this out. Oh boy. Ah. Dun, dun, dun. See it? Yeah, even these coin cells can leak. It can happen. The 2032... Let's, uh, let's do something about that. Now we got lucky there because there really wasn't any damage. Um, just a little bit of crystallization from the leaked chemicals, but I don't see any corrosion. Cleaned up nicely with a little deoxid spray. Here's a brand new battery. I'll just pop that guy right in there. Now this model didn't have the, um, the special batteries, like the, uh, I think it was like a six volt or something like that. Um, I had a model 80. And, uh, yeah, it, it had, um, it had one of those magical batteries that you can't get anywhere. So <laughs> this is built a little better. Um, we're, we're going to clean this thing out at some point. I just want to, before I fire it up, I want to check it over that receiver down there. Um, that guy right there, that thing, uh, that thing blew up unexpectedly when we try to do a, a power test if you will and we don't want to do that again I don't want to repeat that failure um, there are caps on this board that could be failure points but um, I'm just looking at giving it a once-over now this machine was built with higher quality components than what you would find on say your grandma's Dell uh, Inspiron desktop um, this thing has uh, or dimension Dell Dimension desktop. This thing has better quality components from the get-go. This these were built with the highest quality standards that you could get. I mean, for fourteen thousand dollars, you really got your money's worth, um, for sure. Now this card here, um, not this one, this one. Which one did we want to know uh, what it was? Uh, there's our VGA card, by the way. This has a this has a discrete graphics card, which is kind of shocking. Um, I thought the PS2, for the most part, the, the entire product line had a um, had onboard video, but not not on this one. You can, by the way, you can get sound cards for these. Um, I actually had one. I had one for my Model 80, and I ended up getting rid of the machine. Um, the, the Model 80 that I had. I forget what happened to it, but I think it had died. Like, it was just, it, I, you know what it was? No, it didn't die. Um, I was trying to get rid of it, and nobody wanted it. I, I just could not get rid of that machine. So I ended up getting, I, I, I scrapped it. And it was, it was mint. It was really criminal what I had to do, because I just couldn't find a, a taker for it. Nobody wanted to pay for shipping, and nobody wanted to pay money for it, period. So that was a sad, sad day, um, but that's the reality when you're in a hobby that is of 
at least at the time, fairly limited appeal. What I don't like is how this SCSI cable kind of rubs up against the power supply. Well, we'll just knock it in there. I love this. These PS2s, man, they were they were built so well. Well, at least the, the upper end models. But when you get into like the model, I think the model 25, the all-in-one, that was, um, you know, that was not built quite as well. Those have a lot of problems, but anyway. But just look at the, the gauge of, of steel that's on this thing. It's incredible. These were well made for sure. All right. I think that's it. We're going to put the, uh, put the cover back on. I don't believe it'll power up without this guy. Take one more look at this. Now the foam on these, this is a, this is a problem. Uh, this foam, it's actually still intact. We're going to leave it alone. So we're good there. But the foam that they used on these uh, chassis is, is um, it's known to disintegrate and make a sticky, gooey mess all over everything inside. So, a little word to the wise. Just keep an eye out for that. Um, am I doing this right? So I had to switch to this monitor because it had a, v a VGA cable that um, had a few pins missing on it. Um, which is what the video card requires. I forgot what that meant. I think it, I think it, well, notice how this, this one has all the pins populated, but older VGA cables only had a, it had a couple of pins missing. Anyway, so let's turn it on. Now, one of the things uh, that made this system unique is the guarded power switch. Now this one still has the door intact. Let's turn this thing on. Let's see if it turns on. Oh man, I don't know when it was last powered up. Um, could be decades, but here we go. Shit. <laughs> and then Uh-oh. Nope. It wants to. It wants to. It wants to go. The power supply is probably bad. Shit. Or... Or that might have something to do with it. Is that a reset switch? And then we've got this tamper switch, I think. No. Anyway. No. No. Now, I've seen issues where PS2 floppy drives, which, by the way, are bus-powered, uh, they can cause some problems with powering up. We'll unplug that and then we'll give it a try. No, ma'am. All right. I don't smell burning. So we'll start pulling out stuff. We'll start with the um, any unnecessary cards. We'll take this network card out. You know, I haven't had good luck with electronics lately. Um, you know, sometimes it's just, uh, you know, age takes its toll, really. Um, especially on components like capacitors. And uh, I, I think that's what we got going on here. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, we'd have to start, I would say, with a power supply recap, um, especially the big ones. Just get a list made and order them up, just like with that receiver down there. Um, that just seems to be the way things are going for me right now. Um, there's a lot of uh, what look like tantalums. I think that's what those little orange guys are. Those could be, I mean, these can go bad too. 
So, but usually they go out violently. And uh, you see how they're marked with a C, C-150, C-151, C-162. Yeah, they're marked pretty clearly. Um, that means they're capacitors. And I do believe those are surface mount tantalums. Um, so, you know, those go bad quite frequently. And I think that's what we have. We, we have, um, well, I'll do this right. We have a bunch of bad caps in this machine. Probably just one, it could be just one bad one. But if you're going to go for the gold, just start replacing them all. We'll do the whole power supply. I'm not doing it right now. I'm not even going to do it this year. I'm going to put this thing under my bench and forget about it for a while. And then um, I was just hoping that that, that... I just did me some fancy book reading and um, I found this website. Check that out. And there it has some instructions on how to test the power supply. It turns out this model of power supply has a built-in diagnostic system and it's super easy to use. Just unplug everything from it pull it from the system board like show and then we're going to plug in a power cord I'm right over here and we're going to press the self test button you'll notice the light kind of flickers when I plug it in at least there's some kind of a draw um, we're going to find ourselves a ballpoint pen which I just had <laughs> one out. There it is. I saw this little button. I wasn't sure what it was for. Now I know. Uh-oh. Yeah, that narrows it down. That'll save you a little bit of hassle. This, when depressed, what it's going to do is it's going to confirm the functionality of the power supply internally by isolating it from everything else. So what we know now is that this power supply is the problem. We know that for a fact, not even a question now. We don't need to replace the power supply. We just need to repair it. So it's going to go once again on my list of things I got to fix. That receiver being probably priority numero uno. And actually, this is going to be more fun. And surprisingly, probably worth a little bit more than that old receiver. But that's besides the point. I'm going to probably uh, save these two projects for the winter. When things are cold and frosty and, you know, I got all the time in the world to do whatever I want. Let's just see what these are selling for. Just for giggles. Oh my... Oh my. Wow, even $3.99, even that much. That's just insane. $3.99, it was sold. What? So somebody paid 500 bucks, untested, cosmetic wear. You've got to be shitting me. Oh, but it gets better. What the hell? $3,000 for parts or repair. Now, I have to, I have to wonder. Is this a shilled item? Did somebody, well, free shipping. Did somebody bid on their own dead PS2? A dead one sold for... <laughs> <laughs> but it has some pretty cool options. It's missing the bezel here, but it's got a, it looks like an aftermarket hard drive and it's got the optional five and a quarter floppy and two three and a half. Un freaking believable. Error code 96. I forgot what that meant. You've got to be shitting me. Nobody, come on, who would pay that? Who would even a even a diehard collector? Who would pay that? Come on, you gotta be joshing me here. 255, 
Okay, that seems more reasonable. Plus $150 shipping, parts, or repair. Uh, but at least it turns on. No freaking way. No freaking way. I mean, it is one of the most valuable models. I knew that, but three grand for a dead unit? You've got to be kidding me. I had to think I threw one of these in the trash because nobody wanted it. You know, vintage computer collecting is all about timing. Like the iMac. I know those are going to go up in value if they're in good condition. I know they will. So I paid a little bit more than I wanted to. I paid a hundred bucks for this one. But it is an iconic machine. It's going to go up in value. But some of these systems are a gamble. I mean, who would have thought... Even that white box penny and 166 over there, who would have thought that at any point in time that that would ever be worth anything? I mean, seriously, those systems, those, those beige boxes, <laughs> just the cases alone are selling for more than a hundred bucks without a power supply. Um, you throw a complete vintage system in there and you've got something. Um, the iMac G5, utterly worthless totally worthless probably will be for some time the lc2s that i was hawking into the dumpsters right around the time i scored that sweet little ps2 over there those those are actually worth something a couple hundred bucks now the one that really shocked me though the apple 2gs is um a complete functioning unit like that with the drives and the software all ready to go, full package meal deal. Um, those, those, it has, it seems to be hit or miss, but sometimes they're going for about 800 bucks, um, depending on where it is and who's looking. Um, you can, you can get some good money for them and people will pay it. Um, hell, I paid 200 for this 486 Tandy, which I haven't turned on in a long time, but. Hey, it's here. It's mine. Um, but, and it needed a lot of work. It needed a, does it even run? Let's find out. I don't think I've turned it on in quite some time. Let's see if it boots up. 24 megs of RAM. But we're going to save the, the, the IBM's getting salvaged. We're, we're not going to let it die. I have to save it. I'm going to start with a recap on the power supply, and then we're going to go from there. Um, I'm sure the number of people who would pay 900 bucks or more for a PS2, that number of people is dwindling as time goes on. So it's like Elvis memorabilia. I don't think anybody wants that shit anymore. Um, my grandfather, God bless him, he thought that when, you know, before he, you know, when he was ready to retire, he was going to sell all of his Elvis shit. And um, come to find out, all the people who like Elvis are pretty much six feet under by now. And uh, if they're not, they're not looking to pay hundreds of dollars for Elvis dolls and Elvis CDs and Elvis cassette tapes and Elvis pictures and Elvis clocks and all the great stuff he blew his entire life savings on when he was younger. But... Um, you know, vintage computer stuff, it, it, it can, it can catch, it, yeah, you never know, man. You, you never freaking know what is going to go up in value and what will sink like a rock. Printers. Nobody wants printers, but if they want it bad enough, like, for example, um, you know, I wanted the correct Tandy printer for this machine. You got to you gotta pony up because the few people who have them for sale... They're no chumps. They, they they want real money for them. So Image Rider 2s, I think those are still pretty much freebies now. Uh, there's so many. There are so many. I think every Image Rider 2 ever produced still works. Um, they're like the Toyota Camry of printers. They just don't break. But um, except, oh, except for some of the newer models, which have the, um, the switching power supplies in them. The old linear power supply models. They'll never die, but the newer models, which have a switching power supply, yeah, they can blow up. But anyway, uh, <laughs> thanks for watching.